go ahead and uh, share my screen. And also thank you, uh, Siddhish, for making new rips. The publication sound, I don't know, like more fantastic than it is. So I hope I can live up to uh, <laughs> the reputation that you've already built up. So um, I think I need permission to share my screen. Atmika, I think you'll have to allow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... I think you, you should be able to share now. Is it happening? Okay. Yeah. So can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, and I don't think I can see the chat right now. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point um, and let me know. So uh, also, I don't think I can see the 40 minute timer either. So just let me know when we are uh, close to running out of time. I'll give you a time check at around five minutes to 40 minutes. So that sounds sure. good. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, great. So maybe I can get started. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you again for the wonderful introduction and uh, thanks for always, I mean, thanks for, of course, inviting me here and connecting me to Asar and introducing me to all the wonderful work that you're doing. So uh, today I'll be talking a bit about um, the recent work that I've been doing as part of my PhD. Uh, and so I've been focused on using various tools from AI for, uh, for various public health problems and specifically for planning public health interventions. Um, so as an example, I'll be focusing on uh, uh, the use case of planning uh, tuberculosis uh, interventions. Um, and later on, if we have time, I we also touch upon some other work we have done in the space of COVID-19 policy making and all those things. Um, so the primary motivation of this work is derived from community healthcare workers. Um, so as you may know, these community healthcare workers are basically just members of the local community um, who serve as the link between the primary healthcare centers and the people of the community themselves. Um, and um, they function by carrying out various uh, public health related activities such as um, outreach, health education, screening, basic emergency care, and so on. And um, the effectiveness and the impact created by these health workers has been demonstrated by several studies in the past um, in a myriad of domains, um, such as maybe mental health or um, communicable and non-communicable diseases and all these kind of things. So uh, one such example of a concrete um, community health worker task that I'll be focusing on today is that of tuberculosis medication adherence. So th basically, uh, this problem of medication adherence is relevant in case of diseases like TB, in which uh, patients have to uh, take these TB drugs for six months. And uh, so they have to take one pill every day. And it is especially important to make sure that patients are taking their pills because uh, patients usually tend to drop out of the mm, adherence program uh, midway and that leads to more problems like uh, them developing drug resistance and all those kind of things. So one, one job that these CHWs are tasked with is um, to monitor the adherence of um, their patient cohort to their prescribed uh, tuberculosis medication for a period of six months. And um, so from my talks with our partners back in Mumbai in India, what I gathered is that the way this operate is that, uh, operates is that uh, each health worker um, is assigned a large number of patients and his or her duty is to uh, keep a tab on these patients and call them every day uh, to ask whether they have been taking their pills or not. So each time, uh, so let's say uh, each health worker has these large number of patients that she's managing and let's say they call the first two patients on, on day one. So first of all, they gather information from the patients about whether they took their pill yesterday or not. And simultaneously, um, these health workers also deliver interventions to people, especially those who have not been taking their pills, to try to encourage them to take their pills in the future. Um, and so this process goes on, but 
uh, one key constraint that these health workers face is that uh, the resources are severely limited. And the reason for that is that um, each health worker could be responsible for managing a large number of patients, so maybe hundreds of patients. And uh, we can imagine it is not feasible to call all hundreds of patients each day and ask them whether they have been taking their pills or not, and also deliver interventions simultaneously. So, uh, so basically, these health workers need to decide each day uh, which, which subset of their patient cohort to call. And then this process basically goes on um, for the entire treatment program. And uh, as this goes on, they keep on discovering which patients have been taking their pills, and uh, uh, they also deliver uh, interventions to all these patients simultaneously. So to state this problem more formally, uh, we can cast this as a health monitoring and intervention planning problem in which, uh, so just to look at this more formally, we have these end processes uh, where each process can be in either a good state or a bad state. So for example, in the context of TB, uh, these two states would be adhering to medication or not adhering to medication. And uh, these states keep on, I mean, these processes keep on transitioning between these two states each round. So each round is like a day and um, each day uh, they can either take the pill or not take the pill. And further, we also have K intervention resources available per round. So let's say uh, each, health worker can, each health worker can make up to 30 calls per day or something like that, then K would be 30. And um, then this process goes on for a total of T rounds where T is the length of the horizon. So in case of TB, for example, it could be six months or 180 days. And um, the goal of the health worker or the planner who is planning these interventions is to try to maximize the time spent by these processes in the good state. So the problem that we are trying to solve here uh, is deciding which K out of these N processes to intervene on each day. Um, so this is where uh, AI tools could probably help. and. So in order to try to address this problem, uh, we cast this as a restless multi arm bandit problem. Um, so just to take a step back and uh, introduce what restless multi arm bandits are. Um, so these are, uh, so this is basically a very popular uh, AI tool, which has been used to solve a lot of uh, limited resource allocation problems. Um, and so not, so this is, this has been used previously in several domains, such as uh, for sen sensor maintenance or um, planning anti-poaching patrols or even communication related um, applications and so on. Uh, but here we try to uh, cast our intervention planning problem, health monitoring and intervention planning problem as a restless multi arm bandit. Um, and so, I mean, the key feature of this AI tool is that in restless multi arm bandits, we have N arms. So imagine we are uh, in a casino in which there are N poker machines and each time we play a machine, we get some uh, stochastic reward. Uh, so in typical multi arm bandit problems, we are trying to figure out which machines to play uh, because each time we play a machine, we get some random reward. So we get to learn about what is the average reward that each machine is giving us. Uh, but we also ideally want to play the machine which gives us the maximum reward. So there is some exploitation, exploration uh, business going on, and we have to somehow balance this trade-off. Um, and restless multi arm bandits is a similar tool, which is uh, slightly different in that uh, there are a couple of more complications. Um, so like I mentioned, we have these end states, uh, which represent whether the patients have been taking their pills or not. And um, these states keep on changing each, each round, um, uh, irrespective of whom we intervened on and so on. And uh, we also accrue uh, reward from all the arms and not just arms that are pulled. Um, so these are just a couple of minor differences which make it a little more complicated than standard multi-arm bandits. So um, additionally, there is also a lot of related work um, and people have looked at this area of planning, um, you know, health monitors and intervention planning systems. So. Um, one thread of research has looked at building these kind of personalized health monitors and reminder systems, uh, which are basically maybe mobile applications or something like that. Um, and what they assume is that notifications can be sent to their users at will. So notifications such as maybe you should take a walk today or you should you know eat healthy and these kind of things. Um, 
but uh, so one key feature here is that these notifications can be sent to the users at will and so it is not a limited resource setting anymore and it doesn't directly help in solving um, the community health workers planning problem that we are trying to address there are also like i mentioned uh, various other studies which have used restless bandit models for several other uh, limited resource planning tasks uh, but these do not seem to capture all the complexities which are involved in the health monitoring and intervention planning problem. Mm, of course, there are also a few more specific, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so yeah, so some uh, specific RMAP models which are just more general, uh, such as the one by Chen et al. But uh, the problem faced by these models is that these are just way too slow and computationally expensive. So, for example, for running these, we had to run uh, simulations on. Um, uh, Harvard's computing cluster and get the optimal uh, policy as to which K patients to call. But we can imagine this is just not convenient and health workers won't be able to use the system if it is very slow and computationally expensive. So towards addressing these challenges, um, in this paper, we have basically looked at a new restless bandit subclass that we call collapsing bandits. Um, with the key idea being, uh, so this collapsing bandit framework is basically used to solve this health monitoring and intervention planning problem. And as part of the solution technique, we also propose a new solution method, which is much faster than the previously available baselines, such as the Chen et al method. Um, and uh, we also prove theoretical results on uh, uh, basically indexability, which gives us guarantees that this algorithm is going to be asymptotically optimal. Um, and finally, we also did uh, some empirical validation using uh, data sets from the tuberculosis monitoring task, which I mentioned previously. And uh, we are able to show that this new, new algorithm can achieve up to 1000 times speed up as compared to the previous baselines, um, thus, thus allowing this, uh, I mean, planning tool to be available to the health workers, uh, maybe back in Mumbai, uh, so that they can plan their interventions. So. Um, with that, so uh, this Hi. is uh, Aditya. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you, uh, but looks like we have a couple of questions piling up in the in the chat. Okay. Uh, in order to better like so that people better understand the next part of the presentation, do you think we can address some of those questions? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I don't think I can see the chat. Do you mind either just yeah. unmuting sure. or? Uh, Tanmay, do you want to go ahead? and unmute yourself and ask the question yeah um so i'm really sorry uh the the first part i i tried really hard to understand but i didn't really completely grasp the uh, concept of random uh multi arm bandit mm -hmm. i see uh so okay so in multi arm bandits uh so basically um the setting is like this so imagine we are in a casino and uh, there are these 10 slot machines um, and each slot machine has their own, uh, uh, I mean, so, okay. So each slot machine is associated with its own reward. So there is some expected value associated with each slot machine. So if you were to play that machine a large number of times, you would get so much value in return in expectation. Um, however, each time you play that slot machine, uh, the reward is random. So meaning let's say the average reward from slot machine one is 10. It doesn't mean each time you play that machine, we get a reward of 10. Um, it could be five sometimes, it could be 15 sometimes, but on an average, it is 10. So uh, each time we play a slot machine, we only get some observation about um, that random reward. So we can imagine drawing something from distribution, uh, which gives us some sense of what the average reward is. Uh, but basically, we have to play each machine a large number of times to uh, get a good sense of what the average reward is. Um, but while doing so, uh, where we could lose out is that uh, there are these 10 machines available and ideally we want to play the machine which gives us the maximum reward but uh, we don't know what is the average reward that each machine is giving us so the more we play a machine more we get to learn about its reward but ideally we don't want to play a machine which gives us bad reward so there's this exploration exploitation trade-off kind of which we need to balance okay so uh, so i understand that uh, basically where we uh, the more number of times we play the machine the more the, the better estimate we have of the uh, average Mm -hmm. um, but basically the last point that you made, uh, saying that, uh, it's also like, a uh, like you don't want to play the machines, which don't give the, uh, don't give great rewards. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. so how does how do we how do we do that uh yeah so that's a good question and there are several algorithms uh which are built so basically that's a whole research area how to um you know uh, so how to play these arms strategically so that you get to learn uh, you get to explore various machines also but you don't spend too much time on bad machines but intuitively uh, what we do is um so let's say uh, you play all machines once uh, yeah you play each machine once um so you would get some sense of what the expected reward is although that would be a noisy estimate and then you could do various smart things from there and try to figure out which machines to play in the future and those kind of things okay thanks thank you so much i think we also had a question from vishwadi yeah uh, just and so are there any parallels with the challenge to sample essentially you want to identify like uh i i mean i've seen this around in a lot of mental health work like you're collecting surveys maybe or collecting data at some point and you want to find what is the best time to intervene or sample data so are there any parallels with that idea here uh so meaning parallels to uh, so basically uh so are you asking when we should sample or when yeah. we should yeah uh, so essentially like when would be a good time to call up a person and check on their maybe medications so that's yeah so uh, let me just uh, yeah so uh, yeah so that is somewhat related to the problem that we are looking at uh, in mm-hmm. fact so for example uh, we are trying to figure out which patients to call um, at the same time we are also trying to answer this question of when is a good time to call a particular patient because uh let's say you have called this patient number 1 today then it might not be very useful to call the same patient again tomorrow um yeah. so this algorithm is basically trying to plan these interventions just to make sure uh you know so like intuitive things like these are taken care of and the correct people are called uh, at the correct time step okay okay thanks thank you uh i i don't think we have anything else but just one quick thing aditya on one of the slides ahead mm-hmm. i think you mentioned in terms of what contributions your paper had mm-hmm. uh i think a good idea would be to maybe just explain a little bit what asymptotic optimality or vital in like what those things mean or if you are doing that ahead in the presentation that's okay uh yeah so i do have a lot of uh details i had in the presentation but of course i'm not planning to talk about everything because i'll try to keep this as high level as possible uh so basically this is the point that i want to make here about asymptotic optimality is that uh this uh solution technique that we have proposed is a heuristic so the vital index approach is a popular approach used for solving uh restless bandit problems um and that is a heuristic so just to make sure that uh i mean just as a sanity check or just to guarantee that this algorithm is not going to perform miserably or uh, uh, this because just to have some uh, guarantee that this will work uh, so we have proposed these theoretical results which um, guarantee the asymptotic optimality and what asymptotic optimality just means is that uh, when these number of patients and number of resources become really large uh, so the uh, the algorithm tends to the optimal algorithm so for example uh, here uh, if we have just three three patients and we are trying to do this planning framework um then because three is a small number there could be uh, a lot of approximation error but uh, but basically if we have just three patients we can solve this directly and we don't need fancy algorithms but if you have a large number of patients so let's say hundreds or thousands of patients um, this proposed algorithm is going to uh, tend to the actual optimal algorithm which we just can't find the actual optimal solution thanks that makes sense yeah thanks okay uh, so let's continue ahead then do we have any other questions by the way up like up until this part cool okay so if there are not um, i will proceed ahead and uh, this is the uh, road map for what i was planning to talk today um, and although i think i have a lot of technical details on the slides i will skip through most of them because um i'll try to keep this as high level as possible 
so uh, diving into this first uh, first part of the book um so just to recall uh, here uh, we are proposing this new collapsing bandits framework for solving the health monitoring and intervention planning problem and uh, what the the main features of collapsing bandits are um, uh, so this basically is a new armap subclass in which each arm of this bandit so each arm is basically each patient and so the way we modeled it is that each arm is a partially observable markov decision process um and if you are not sure what pomdps are uh, so this basically means there are two states that each arm can be in a bad state and a good state like i had mentioned uh, so in the context of tb this could be not taking the pill or taking the pill and for each arm we have two actions available whether we should call that arm or patient or uh, sorry we should not or we should call that arm or patient and depending on what we do for each arm we get some observations in return so for example if we decide to call a particular patient we can observe that the patient was either not taking their pills or we can observe that the patient was taking their pills but if we do not take any action so rather if we take the no no intervention action uh, we get a null observation so basically meaning we do not get to observe anything about the patient uh, and that's what makes this partially observable um further we also assume that the transitions i mean the transition probabilities between these two states are known and we associate a reward of 0 if the patient is in the bad state and a reward of 1 if the patient is in the good state um and the story call we are trying to maximize the reward or we are trying to maximize the time spent by these patients in the adhering state uh so so let me just give a high level of um, so basically the solution techniques that we are employing uh, for solving our maps so the heuristic that i mentioned before uh, is this whittle solution technique which we are looking at and this was proposed by whittle uh, back in 1988 and the way this works is that uh, so right now we have this big mega problem which consists of n arms and we are trying to decide which k arms to pull so if we were to solve this problem directly our um, action space uh, would be of the size n choose k because we are trying to choose k arms out of these n arms and uh, because each arm can be in two states uh, the total state space would also be 2 raised to n uh, so as you can imagine this would easily blow up with um, n uh, and it becomes very quickly infeasible to solve this problem directly and so the heuristic proposed is to uh, focus on one arm at a time and try to compute the value of being active for that particular arm and by active i mean value of pulling that arm uh, so the idea is that this decouples all the n arms and it converts this one mega problem into n auxiliary but much smaller problems consisting of just one arm and two possible states and two possible actions whether to call that arm or not um and finally the idea is to somehow compute this index for mm-hmm. each arm which captures the value of acting on that arm and this value is basically nothing but the expected improvement in the future uh, future adherence of that arm or patient um as a result of this intervention and once we compute such an index for all the arms the idea is to call the patients with the largest indices so if we have a budget of k we would pick the k largest indices and call those k, k patients um so i won't dive into the details of uh, how these mark out uh, yeah how these mdps work and all those things but basically the idea is that we are able to formulate this as a mark out decision process and uh, we know several things about the mark out decision process such as the transition functions and um, what happens when we are uh, when we decide to intervene on a particular arm and when we do not and we have uh, there are more technical details like we have an associated reward function um but so while adopting this whittle index approach there are uh, two main challenges which are usually faced so first challenge is of course computing the value of this index which will approximate the uh, value of an intervention um and so so the key idea uh, of this whittle approach uh, is centered around the concept of passive subsidy so um again i won't dive into what the passive subsidy uh, does and how it is computed but intuitively uh, this passive subsidy tries to answer this question um how much would i have to pay you not to act so 
imagine we are focusing on one arm or one patient at a time and uh, assuming there is infinite budget available the optimal thing to do on each arm would be to call the patient um, but however because we are trying to estimate the value of calling that patient uh, the way we the way this works is that we try to estimate how much would i have to pay you to make the passive action so basically not calling action just as attractive as the calling action and um, this value is nothing but the vital index which we are trying to compute for each arm and uh, computing this index has been shown to be difficult uh, and that has been the uh, i mean one of the challenges that previous studies have focused on and the other challenge is of course uh, proving uh, theoretical guarantees um, so again i won't dive into what that means but that is something that we show in the paper um, and as part of the contribution of this work we of course show that uh, these theoretical guarantees hold for the collapsing bandit setting and we show that intuitively uh, something called threshold policies are optimal which means uh, if you imagine each patient and uh, like i think uh, some uh, someone asked before so uh, let's say we call a particular patient uh, uh, before so let's say we call a patient today then ideally we would want to wait until um, our belief about that patient being in the uh, good state drops below a certain threshold so basically if you are sure that a person is adhering then we might attach little value to calling the same patient again uh, so we might want to wait for some amount of time before we call the same patient again and uh, we would repeat this process for all the all the patients so this just just to sorry to interrupt but just a quick question so this mm -hmm. threshold would kind of be dynamic at each call and would also vary across the different patients as well right yes correct so each patient has their own transition functions and so uh, the threshold would be different for all patients and it would also depend on yeah it would change dynamically uh but so this is the key intuition that we are leveraging here for first of all proving all the theoretical guarantees and also for coming up with a faster algorithm because uh now using this intuition uh we can so if threshold policies are indeed optimal uh we can restrict our search space to just threshold policies and not all possible n choose k policies that we could adopt and that really helps us in making the algorithm uh, so 1000 times fast as as i'll show you in uh, one of the results later uh, so some nice things that we found about threshold policies is that first of all we show that these are indeed optimal and that's nice for us um and some other nice things are that these also cover a majority of the uh, patients in the real tb data uh, that we had obtained from patients in mumbai and uh, so empirically we also we also find that uh, this collapsing bandits so all collapsing bandits even beyond uh, this the uh, um, tb data all of them seem to uh, follow this property of threshold optimality and that's really nice for us because then that allows us to prove those uh, theoretical guarantees and it also allows us to come up with a very fast algorithm which helps us actually compute the index uh, much faster um, so i'll skip the details of how that algorithm works for now but the key result that uh, we are able to achieve as a result of this is that uh, if we if we look in at the graph on the left so here we have basically run simulation experiments using the tuberculosis patient data uh, that was available from patients in mumbai and uh, we found that we are able to uh, so achieve a huge speed up so here our algorithm is the one in green which computes the k best arms to pull and the orange plots the runtime of the best available baseline by chen et al um and uh, so what this basically means is that we are able to make this algorithm run almost 1000 times faster for this uh, tuberculosis medication planning problem and we the nice thing is that we are able to achieve this speed up without having to sacrifice on the performance so if you look at the graph on the right um, the bar in the middle is basically our algorithm and the bar right next to it is the best baseline and the bar after that is kind of an oracle and we see that we are not really sacrificing much performance uh, for achieving the speed up and um and this is nice because now we can make this algorithm available to health workers uh, back in india and it can run on any simple laptop without really needing a computing cluster or any heavy computation resources like that um adhikam sorry to interrupt you have 5 minutes mm -hmm. left 
Yes. So I think. Uh, uh, do you want to rejoin? Um, yeah, yeah. So this, I feel like this is a good logical breakpoint. So would it make sense to stop now and rejoin? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, so everybody just join back in the same link. Just exit right now and then. Okay. Can I? Okay. Um, yeah. I think you should be able to. Uh, yep. Um. Oh, hi. Uh, Pushkar, this side. Sorry. To, uh, yeah. So actually, I just want to know that, like, uh, how how do we calculate this intervention benefit here? On the because that's a that's not an completely observable uh environment, right? As in. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Good question. So uh. So for computing this um intervention benefit. So here we have basically evaluated this through simulations, and uh, the way this works is that um, we simulate uh, uh, each cohort uh, and apply various policies on uh, on the cohorts. So basically, we oh, simulated. Uh, yeah. So we simulated our algorithm, this baseline, and also uh, uh, in another simulation we ran. I mean, one simulation consisted of no interventions at all, and the way we have defined this intervention benefit is uh, the reward of one particular algorithm minus the reward of no interventions at all, and that is also then scaled from zero to hundred and normalized and all those things. Okay, yeah, thanks. I just had one quick question. So yes. the the collapsing bandit. Uh, so from what I understood, it's working on kind of a binary state problem, right? Mm -hmm. Do like do you think? It, it will give similar results or do you know if it gives similar results on problems that are not binary state maybe when there are like multiple contesting decisions to be made more than two uh yeah so that's a great question actually and so that was one of the assumptions of this work but it's of course an interesting problem to uh tackle i think first of all multiple states and also multiple actions um and so in a follow-up uh, paper of this work so this work was done uh, so with jackson killian who was also the joint co-author co-first author on this work and as a follow-up of this paper he has uh, worked on another project in which he has explored multiple actions so for example here we just have two actions whether to call a patient or not call a patient but um in practice we could have more possible options like whether to do a house visit um or several other things like that uh, so I know that uh, he has looked at building systems in which you could accommodate multiple actions, um, accommodating multiple states. With, so like right now there are just two states, good and bad, but there could be more. Uh, and that so accommodating more states is also an interesting problem. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an open problem or not, but it's likely. I mean, it's definitely non-trivial, um, and would be interesting to look at extensions. And just to follow up, in case of multiple actions that that you said your colleague is looking at, uh, mm -hmm. did he did he kind of see the same like runtime results and intervention benefit? Uh, so from what I remember, he uh, yeah. So the so there are existing algorithms which can handle multiple actions, but the problem there again is that those are very slow. So. One key contribution of his work was that he was able to speed that process up, um, but I'm not sure how that compares to this particular algorithm in which there are two actions. Uh, so I mean, I'm assuming more actions would make it slower, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how exactly it compares. No, I mean the only reason to ask was that if 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 like I mean if like collapsing bandits kind of setting is. Uh, working across more states and actions, mm -hmm. that's actually a very good uh, solution for a lot of public health intervention problems. Then, so that's why. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. So, uh, I mean, I would be glad if I'm able to convince you that restless bandits could be a very useful tool uh, for tackling other uh, public health problems also. So I know that we are also exploring using these for other applications like. Um, maternal health and so on, but those are all in very early stages. So, um, question like you said, like that. I had a Hi. quick question. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, should I continue? 
Yeah, please. I am not sure. Yeah. Who yeah, this is Shweta. So, uh, I see that you have uh, stated that there are two states, uh, good or bad, like mm -hmm. uh, patients taking the pill or not taking the pill. But since mm -hmm. uh, the action here is calling, I assume there can be a third state where uh, you, do, you do not get any answer from the patient, like someone is not picking up the call. Like, uh, so, so not incorporating that third state, does that um, make any difference or how is that being? Yeah, that's a great question. And I feel like you uh, beat me by one slide to that because uh, that is definitely a shortcoming or some, I mean, some limitation of this work. Uh, but that is something that we have addressed in our future work in which uh, it may not be possible to get these perfect observations of whether uh, the patient was adhering or not adhering. It may not be binary like that. But like you mentioned, sometimes the patient may not even pick up your call or uh, we may get an observation which is kind of imprecise because maybe the patients misrepresent their state of adherence or I don't know, there could be several other things. Um, but that is certainly um, one limitation of this previous work which uh, we had this in the future work. Um, and I can talk a little more about that in a few minutes. Thank you for the question. Uh, hi, Aditya Surbi here. I just had a quick question. Um, so I understood the framework, I think uh, a lot of it, but uh, how exactly will this be implemented at the level of the community health worker? Like when, at what point will they get a data of which uh, which patients they should be calling for maximum benefit like since you said it's like a variable number which will keep changing with every other patient that they call right so like at what point do you get that number yeah so uh the way we can envision this or i envision this is that each each day uh so let's say uh, there is one health worker who is managing 200 patients and each day we give them a list of let's say 20 patients that they should call and um, at the end of the day, once they call all, once they make all the 20 calls, we get 20 observations. So assuming we get perfect observations, we would figure out which patient was adhering, which patient was not. And for the remaining 180 patients, we would not know uh, any, we would not have any new information. Uh, um, so at the end of getting all uh, these 20 observations, uh, we would run our algorithm again each day or with each night and generate a fresh batch of 20 um, people to intervene on, um, on the next day. Okay, so like once you run through all like taking groups of 20, once you run through all the 200 patients, then you will be able to generate an algorithm for... No, uh, so we don't, we don't need to run through all 200. So okay. uh, just going back to that picture, which I had. Uh, so yeah, so basically um, we just, so there are a large number of patients, but we just recommend a small number of patients. And once we get the readings from these small number of patients, so let's say the health worker calls these two patients here and we also that both of them were adhering and earlier uh, she had called these first two patients and just using these four data points uh, we can run our algorithm again and for the third time time step we can generate recommendations for which patients they should call okay okay interesting yeah thank you thank you for the question uh, yes sir. good question like uh, so just quickly went through the transition probabilities, but like when you start working on a problem, how do you start, like what numbers do you start with and how does it change based on each iteration? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, so here we assume that we know these transition probabilities, um, but in real life we don't, right? So the way uh, we can address this is that um, first of all, we can employ online learning techniques um, such as Thomson sampling in which we keep on updating our belief about this transition function um, in an online fashion. And so basically we keep on updating the transition matrix every round and redo the computation. Um, and further, we can also use the fact that we have um, historical data about all the thousands of patients that we have seen in the past and all, yeah, so all the behavior that they have displayed in the past. And uh, so for all those patients in our historical batch data, we can estimate their transition matrices and then use those and uh, employ, let's say, other techniques like clustering or something like that to map each new incoming patient to one of the patients that we have seen in the past and try to start off with their transition matrix as a prior and then update that in an online fashion using, let's say, Thomson sampling and those kind of things. 
a, a kind of quick follow up on that is is collapsing bandits using online learning then or offline learning and like does that does that matter to the computational costs yeah so uh, right now in the paper and for all these results which i have displayed uh, so collapsing bandits is amenable to both but right now we have assumed that the transition matrices are known and this we have just focused on the planning framework uh, because that itself has been shown to be a piece space hard problem and even if we know the transition functions perfectly uh, coming up with the optimal intervention planning uh, is a difficult problem so that is what we have focused on but in the paper we have also uh, uh, shown results and proposed this technique to use thomson sampling um, and shown that it can we can use thomson sampling for learning these transition functions on the go and that would still happen on a laptop right like that wouldn't add any more burden to yes. okay yeah because uh, yeah that just changes um, the algorithm from an offline mode to online mode but because the uh, computation is so fast uh, the computational cost is still pretty low thanks i just another quick question mm -hmm. uh would this also kind of depend on the sample of data you have like i'm assuming you kind of would uh expect some sort of representativeness of the data you have like assume um the procedure for calling people maybe identifying with a lower socio economic neighborhood that would kind of differ um drastically from those belonging to maybe higher socio economic so i'm kind of assuming like uh that these procedures would be different but is the algorithm currently or maybe you've thought about this like how can these different socio economic factors also be incorporated yeah um yeah so i guess that's a good point because um so those these factors socio economic factors and various other features or information that we could have access to about patients would certainly uh, i mean it could be very useful in trying to estimate the transition functions displayed by those patients and so if you are looking at this learning problem in which we are trying to learn the transition transition function um all these pieces of information will be very useful um however in this work uh, so in this particular paper we have assumed that the transition functions are known and uh, if we are just given the ground truth of the transition functions then we don't really uh, care about the other features because we are now only focusing on the planning problem and not the learning problem got it so that would be an entirely different learning problem to learn these transition functions when the data is not very representative yes, yes. okay thanks but i think that's true with any mdp right in any mdp whatever information you have like once that goes into initial like initial probab like state probabilities mm -hmm. and transition probabilities you don't have to care about the actual raw information right yeah 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 so uh, yeah so i've seen so some papers basically focus on estimating a good offline problem and so basically separating the two learning problem and the planning problem and once we have uh, estimated the parameters somehow then planning problem is a completely different thing cool do we have any more questions or else we should let him continue with his talk uh, yeah cool okay aditya let's continue okay so uh, maybe just in the interest of time um, because we have 20 minutes uh, so what i can do is instead of diving into all the details i can just talk about the motivation for uh, a couple of other projects and the key contribution um and, and i'll hope to wrap up in maybe 5 minutes or 10 minutes something like that so um uh, like someone had pointed out so there are a lot of uh, issues with uh, this existing collapsing bandit framework and it's not it's definitely not ready for real world deployment yet and so uh, to just to highlight three key issues that um, this framework could face um one uh, issue could be that of uh, equitable allocation um, so for example uh, this planning algorithm may just deem some patients to be less valuable to intervene on uh, maybe because they respond poorly to interventions and so on and uh, this algorithm may end up recommending to ignore these kind of patients completely throughout their treatment program um and this of course could be quite alarming from a real world 
perspective in which we do we do not want to just completely ignore any uh, patient just because uh, it is suboptimal to intervene on them and uh, this so uh, the result of this could be manifested i mean it manifests in the simulations in which uh, if you look at this x equal to 0 in this graph so this graph uh, is a histogram plot of the number of adherent days displayed by various patients in the simulation and this blue spike at x equal to 0 uh, basically stands for patients who have adhered very little in their uh, treatment program and this could perhaps be a result of these patients being ignored by that algorithm and so that's why they do so poorly uh, during their treatment program um secondly like uh, i had mentioned before uh, we it, it, i mean we may not always get perfect observations from the patients so for example sometimes the patients may not pick our call um and so there could be several other observations possible that we should account for ideally um and thirdly uh this planning algorithm which i talked about assumes that um the planner is risk neutral but um in real world of course the planner uh, may not be risk neutral so a lot of real world planners may, may be risk averse for example and what that means is that uh the planner would rather prefer to have some patients who are adhering to their medication for sure um rather than having a lot of patients who are mm, adhering to their medication with only 50% probability something like that um and so uh, for incorporating these or rather basically accommodating these three concerns with existing work uh, we proposed a new planning framework uh, which was also recently accepted to amas 2021 and it's going to be the conference is happening in a week or something so it's going to be presented there um but the key contribution um of uh, yeah so the key contribution of this new framework was to somehow incorporate a more general reward function instead of this linear reward functions which was a feature of the previous work and that uh, so these non linear reward functions basically help us um, capture uh, considerations like risk risk aware uh, planning and these kind of things which address issue number 1 and issue number 3 so equitable resource allocation and risk aware planning and we also came up with new machinery to handle these imprecise observations um and we again showed all the theoretical guarantees which uh, which were proven in the previous work so that of indexability and uh, we also ran similar empirical validation tests on this real and other synthetic domain to show that everything still works uh, when we have this general reward function and multiple observations and all those kind of things so the key take away from this new framework was that uh with this general reward function uh, we can now focus on um the considerations that the health workers really care about the most uh rather than just focusing on optimizing for the average adherence of the entire patient cohort so for example um uh, this figure shows that the figure on the left uh shows that our new algorithm which is this risk aware algorithm can do much better in terms of utility to the health workers um even when uh, it is doing worse in terms of the average adherence of the patient cohort um and as an example of this if uh, our planner was risk averse uh then we could employ a reward function like the one shown uh, on right in which the reward steeply becomes high when the belief value tends to 1 and uh, what that does is it tries to incentivize this planning algorithm to try to push as many patients as possible towards the high belief zones um and the result of this is manifested in this adherence histogram um in which blue was the previous algorithm and orange is the new one and what this orange algorithm basically does is scoop out some patients from this middle adherence zone and push some of these to the really high adherence zones so if you were to look at the number of patients who uh, finished their adherence program with greater than 90% adherent days um uh, then such a risk aware algorithm uh, shows much uh, so it shows a lot of improvement as compared to the previous algorithm um so that's the main uh, take away of this work and further there are also other limitations uh such as uh, so the, the two key challenges are uh, that length of health programs in real world are could be finite um and in real world uh so yeah yeah in real world settings new patients basically join healthcare programs each day and existing enrolled patients also leave the program each day um, so this is something that we have not accounted for in our current planning framework 
because we basically assume there are these n arms which start at t equal to zero and end at t equal to six months or something like that. But the real systems are much more dynamic. Um, so we have presented new uh, ideas to incorporate uh, this dynamically changing population and all those kind of things. Um, I won't dive into the details of that right now, but basically the idea is to um, interpolate. So come up with an interpolation algorithm, which accounts for the changing brittle index as a result of this dynamic population. And uh, the takeaway is that uh, this interpolation technique allows us to come up with a fast algorithm, uh, which is also, uh, which also shows good performance, like which was the theme of the takeaway in the previous algorithms. Um, so I, I think I'm almost out of time. So, uh, this was all the, uh, work on this tuberculosis, uh, plan. Uh, yeah. So tuberculosis health monitoring and planning framework, which I wanted to talk about. Um, there are also some other directions related to COVID-19, which we have explored in our lab, uh, most of it led by, um, somebody, somebody else in the lab. Uh, but I'm happy to stop here and maybe take questions on the previous work or chat about anything else. Um, <clears throat> Hi, uh, first of all, great work. I, as Sulvi said, I think I understood most of it. Um, so I wanted to ask, what, one of my questions was the fact that um, the TV notification in Mumbai, especially since you have the data for it, you must have realized that the daily notification rate is quite high. And um, somehow, like your model doesn't account for the fact that so and I can say on an average, in Mumbai, there might be around 500 to 600 patients daily notified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any action in place, whether in the coming studies, whether you would be able to account for that? Uh, in this algorithm, I just wanted to ask that. Yes, so uh, uh, so in this uh, most recent work, which is still kind of in the pipeline, we have looked at um, theoretical analysis of what we would do if there are new patients who are joining the program each day and um, you know current patients leaving the program. Uh, so, however, we haven't deployed this in practice, or uh, we don't have new data or uh, you know real world deployment experiments. Um, but we have come up with, and this paper is available on archives. Um, but we have come up with a new algorithm, which kind of captures this, um, incoming and outgoing behavior. And we have proposed this framework called streaming bandits to, uh, basically tackle these cases. Um, I also wanted to ask about the threshold, how many calls, um, so for one arm, how many calls should be done so that it can give you the result for how, you know, when the patient has to be called again. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So for each arm, um, it basically depends on the transition function, but, uh, the correct answer to how often we should call each arm also depends on what are the other arms in the system. Um, right. Because what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with the K best arms to call. So for each arm independently, we are computing, uh, some index, which captures the value of calling that arm. And once we have that index for all the arms, that will determine which arms we end up pulling. So it could so happen that we end up calling a particular arm every day for 180 days, according to that algorithm, because it's just more optimal to call that arm as compared to others. Uh, but that could change if there are different arms, which suddenly become more attractive than this given arm. That's why you meant that one of the limitations is that one of like few arms could just get neglected in the entire algorithm. That's yeah, exactly. Uh, we still have time. So if anybody else asks, I uh, want one wants to ask any questions uh, or have any questions for Aditya, y'all can go ahead. Uh, if you don't have questions, Aditya, do you want to like maybe not run through the slides, mm -hmm. but talk a little bit about what other work you are doing and beyond TB and, and like, how do you see the general utility of AI to public health? Yeah. Uh, so I do have some, uh, 
stuff on covid 19 related work which um, so i have done and some others in my lab have also worked on um, maybe i can just uh, give a like very brief overview of that um, so uh, this was work that we did around this time last year when um, uh, so you know of course there was lockdown in most countries in the world but um, in india there was this very very severe lockdown which was announced and i think um, that was the largest lockdown uh, announced anywhere in the world back then um, and uh, one interesting point that we wanted to look at was uh, so what is a good lockdown policy to adopt for a particular um, you know government so maybe at the country level or district level state level and so on um, and uh, so the issues uh, that we were faced with is that if a particular country announces a very severe lockdown um then of course it's very good at curbing the spread of the disease but it of course has a lot of economic and uh, social implications and it is of course very strenuous um on the other hand if a country chooses to go with mild physical distancing um so basically mild covid-19 protocols but not uh, imposing a strict lockdown then um it so of course there are more contacts and so there is higher risk of infection spread but it also allows some normalcy uh, um and yeah some return to normal uh, so one approach that we had looked at was exploring these middle ground policies and um, so these basically just alternate between this complete lockdown and mild physical distancing and we had looked at whether this could be um, a possible option to adopt uh, for so any yeah so any decision making body at uh, whatever level so maybe country or uh, state and so on and uh, so to do that uh, to to do that there was this um, agent based model uh, which has now been published at pns last year um, and so this was effort led by one of my wonderful colleagues brian wilder um, and this model basically runs uh, so this is an agent based model which can simulate various things and it consists of various agents um, where each agent is basically um, like a person uh and that agent has various characteristics like um it is so there is first of all there is household structure so each agent could belong to a family and could be interacting with various with various other agents and each agent could also have some features such as age and uh you know several other uh behavior patterns and we can then use this agent based model to run simulations about on uh, simulations of various policies so uh we can use that to measure the effect of a particular lockdown policy so what would happen if you impose this lockdown policy or restrict number of contacts to so much and all those kind of things and this simulation gives out uh, an estimate of the number of uh, resulting infections and we use that to basically evaluate these uh, middle ground policies and uh, so the key takeaway was that they seem to strike a good balance um so uh, I, maybe i should not dive into the details of all this right now uh but another uh, in- interesting thing that we have been looking at recently and this paper is still in the pipeline um is a game theoretical approach for hier- hierarchical policy making um and so what we are looking at here is that uh, we are trying to look at how uh, the strategic interaction among various hierarchical policy makers impact uh, the policy strength and costs so basically uh, if you look at united states there is this federal government and there are various state governments and there are ultimately counties um and various levels of governments could recommend various um, lockdown policies to implement um but the i mean ultimately the number of infections only depend on what the actual counties do or what kind of lockdown actual people observe um so in this paper we have looked at how uh, so we have modeled this as a game theoretical model first of all and looked at what interesting strategies or uh, yeah so, yeah what are the interesting strategies that each player at each level can come up with and some other interesting phenomena either could you like elaborate a little bit on what kind of strategies uh like in this model yes so uh, here um, so by strategy uh, what i meant was uh, so we have defined strategy as the degree of lockdown or de- uh, yeah degree of social distancing that people follow uh, 
so uh, so in this game theoretical framework we have agents at three levels at the top there is the the federal government and in the middle level there are the various states and at the bottom are the counties and um, each agent can adopt a particular strategy which means they can adopt uh, they can pick a number between 0 and 1 which captures the degree of uh, social distancing that uh, that they are recommending so for example, a social distancing factor of one means there is no uh, lockdown at all. And a factor of zero could mean that everybody is um, isolating at homes and nobody's moving out. Um, but uh, this is, I mean, the game theoretical interaction here is derived from the fact that even though the federal government may recommend some strategy, um, the state governments may not fully comply with that. And they may pick some other strategy. So picking some other strategy might come at some non-compliance cost. Uh, but like, for example, if they pick a stronger strategy, so a more strict lockdown, that may also uh, give them a better, I mean, a lower number of infections and so a lower um, infection cost, for example. Um, and so this is kind of a game theoretical interaction in which even though the federal government has recommended some lockdown strategy, each bottom level player has to pick their own strategies and try to minimize their own costs. Um, so in the paper, we have also looked at some other aspects such as free riding and all those kind of things. So we can imagine that if there are, let's say 10 states and nine of the 10 states are, you know, in perfect complete lockdown, uh, then the 10th state might want to not impose any lockdown at all because, um, because everybody else is, uh, in perfect lockdown and so it's kind of a free rider here um and so we have also looked at this aspect in more detail and done some experiments in the paper we have around uh, five minutes left so if anybody else has any questions regarding pp medication or study or this one uh i can go right ahead and ask Uh, yes, and if you want to ask me questions later, you can always either email me or yeah, so basically feel free to reach out to me later also. Mm -hmm. And happy to take questions now also, of course. So like Aditya, uh, about the multi-level hierarchical model, for game theory uh as in like i'm i'm not really uh getting the kind of interactions that uh maybe like a federal government and the state government will have in that case as in like how they will uh what do they say they uh the the reward metrics or how that will look like i'm not really able to get that can you elaborate a little yeah yeah sure so uh I don't know if I have backup slides. I think I might have few, but uh, let me try to explain the high level idea here. So um, let's say the federal government has picked a particular strategy alpha. Um, so mm -hmm. if you assume all states and all counties are complying with this alpha, then mm -hmm. um, so let's say all states are also adhering to that same alpha and all counties have also selected the same alpha. Now, if you uh, look at, so let's say if you pick a particular county, and try to compute the Nash equilibrium for that county, then this alpha may not be the Nash equilibrium because uh, the cost structure for the federal government uh, would be different from the cost, uh, I mean, the cost function of the uh, county and also the co cost function of the state. Um, because um, so each county, so the way we have modeled it, modeled it is that uh, there are three sources of costs to all the counties and all the states. Uh, mm -hmm. First source is, of course, the economic cost of a particular um, social distancing policy. Mm -hmm. The other is, of course, the economic cost, which is determined by number of new infections. Um, mm -hmm. And the third cost is the non-compliant cost, which is right. the cost of moving away from whatever the uh, higher up level has recommended. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Right. because different counties could have different economic costs uh, for mm -hmm. the same alpha, uh, this may not be an Nash equilibrium. I mean, one particular uh, might not be a Nash equilibrium. And so different counties might have different preferences and those kind of things. Okay. Yeah. As in like the, the non-compliance cost was the key factor in understanding the hierarchy. 
Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for this. Um, I just had a follow up question, and forgive me because my understanding of game theory is really limited. But so, by applying this model, did you like come up with the optimal strategy that should be taken up by, like, let like you said, nine states could take a complete lockdown, and one could be a freeloader. So that was an example. So, did you were you able to model an optimal strategy as such? Um. So yes and no. So uh, I mean, so in this framework, uh, we do not. directly recommend what is the optimal strategy that let's say the federal government should adopt but we can recommend what steps could be taken up to mitigate free riding and these other uh, phenomena which we want uh, to reduce if that makes sense okay but at the level of the federal government or and at the level of the counties yes so at at each level so i don't know if there is a particular answer to what is the best strategy that let's say the federal government should adopt or state government should adopt uh, so this could just be the nash equilibrium because uh, nash equilibrium equilibrium would be the uh, best strategy that each each level agent would adopt and we can of course compute that um, and that also is a non trivial problem as we have shown in the paper uh, but so yeah so we can compute the nash equilibrium uh, but further we have looked at uh, what so under what conditions can let's say free riding happen and If free riding is happening, then what can we do to mitigate free riding? So, what kind of policies we can adopt and those kind of things? Okay, it's actually quite interesting that you guys chose to apply this here. Very um, interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we just have less than a minute. So, if anybody has more questions, um, you should join in, join back. But the call might end any time now. Yeah, I can just display my email address again. So feel free to email me if you have any questions. I might have to run in ten minutes for uh, a lunch meeting. All right, all right. Then, then thanks, Aditya, for joining us today, giving us your time. It's been really wonderful for all of us. Thank you so much, and I was delighted to be. I mean, get to know all of you and interact with you. And thanks a lot for the wonderful efforts that Asar is taking up. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for the chat. Thank you.